Oh, yeah? Welcome, everyone. I may have your attention. I'm Mark Kruger. I'm the Assistant District Attorney here in Carson City. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to tonight's forum. This forum is brought to you by the Sierra Nevada Forums and Partnership Carson City. And the intent of the forum is not to revisit uh, medical marijuana or the, the law that came to pass and matriculated, but rather to take a look at where we are and where we're going. The forum hopes to explain what is included in the Nevada Administrative Code, which is the law that was passed by the, by, uh, in support of the, of the NRS, by the legislature, allowing for medical marijuana and dispensaries, and of course also uh, to visit our recent ordinance that was just passed on July 3rd, uh, allowing for uh, zoning of dispensaries and medical marijuana in Carson City. Um, we hope that we're going to also explain the next steps uh, that must be taken for those who want uh, to operate these types of businesses in Carson City. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Barry Smith, who is tonight's moderator and the president of the Nevada Press Association. Hi, right, thank you very much. Um, let me explain, uh, thank you, all, first of all, to the Sierra Nevada Forums uh, for taking this on and, and uh, very appreciative. I hope you learn a lot. Um, there are, we already have had submitted several questions in advance, so we have some, but if you have questions um, as you come up, there are a couple of people, um, one over here, at least wandering around up and down the aisle who uh, will present you with cards that you can write down a question. But you ought to listen to what the speakers say and see what comes up there. I think they'll answer some of the questions that we already have uh, presented here and so forth. The, f the first uh, speaker, because uh, we, 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 we don't have any back and forth with these. It's present the questions. We'll have these, these folks over here take a look, read them, try and get them relevant. We'll try and keep the answers short so that we can get as many questions as possible also. So first up is going to be Steve Gilbert. He's the program manager. Um, Mar 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 Medical Marijuana Bureau of Preparedness, Assurance, it's Inspections, and Statistics for the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, he's going to look at the state law and uh, give an overview of the program. And then after S Steve, then we have uh, Lee Plemmel and Susan Pansky, um, Carson City staff, the De Community Development Debar <coughs> Department, who are gonna go over the city ordinance. We're gonna get the state view, uh, the city view. Then we have a panel that we're gonna address the questions as they come up too. So 
Thanks again. Let Steve get underway. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate the introduction. As Barry said, I'm Steve Gilbert. I'm with the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. I'm the program manager for the medical marijuana program. I want to thank everybody for having us here. Um, we appreciate um, spending this time and educating the public on uh, the medical marijuana program. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go into a little bit of a, a program description, uh, just a brief, broad overview of the program. Then I'll go into the program structure, how it's changed um, structure with the passing of SB 374. Then I'll go into a little bit on how patients receive their medical marijuana registry cards. Then I'll go into the building of the medical marijuana establishment program, the passing of the regulations, the processes that we went through uh, to get the regulations passed, as well as the, uh, what we're going to be going into in the next uh, 90 days, 120 days. And then I'll go into a little bit on the, uh, the application process, which is uh, what we're going to be starting on very soon. So the, the program description, the program review, the Nevada Medical Marijuana Program is a state registry program uh, where we register all eligible applicants for a registry um, identification card uh, to be on the medical marijuana program. Now the Medical Marijuana Establishment Program, which is the new program, um, is for all um, independent testing laboratories, cultivation facilities, facilities for production of edibles, which is the production facilities, as well as infused products, and the medical marijuana dispensaries, which is where the medicine is dispensed to the public. Um, not the public, I'm sorry, but to the registry card holders. They are not open to the public. So the medical marijuana description continued. Oh, I'm sorry, did I skip it? Nope. The medical marijuana uh, program individuals apply for the. I'm sorry, slide ahead of myself. So the history of the program. Um, the Nevada legislature passed the medical marijuana legislation in 2001, which uh, legalized the uh, registration of medical marijuana patients card holders. There was amendments to the legislature or the the process is in 2003, 2009, and 2013, which is the most recent one. Originally, the program, and what it still continues to, is it allowed patients to use medical marijuana if they were approved to be a registry card holder. Um, it also required patients to grow their own medicine, um, which the dispensaries changed, changed some, which I'll go into a little bit later. So the new medical marijuana program structure now the program is basically baked, broken up into two approved authorized groups. We have the Medical Marijuana Cardholder Program and we have the Medical Marijuana Establishment Program. The Medical Marijuana Establishment Program is what we're building now and we're implementing the processes and the regulations. So this slide's a little bit hard to see, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into a little bit on how the registry cardholders receive their cards. It's an application process that takes approximately uh, 48 days from the start that the patient receives their application from the division. Um, I'll go to the next slide. It breaks it down a little bit easier and a little bit, a little more and a little easier to see. So the process begins when the applicant uh, contacts the division to receive an application. That application fee currently is $25. Uh, the division will send the applicant a application in the mail, or if they want to pick it up in person, they can come to our office here in Carson City. So with our data that we've collected and the processes that we follow and implement, we see that it's taken applicants approximately 48 days or 27 days to return their application to the division. Um, until we receive that application back from the applicant, we cannot start the process to uh, process their card. So what they're doing in those 21 days is they're, they're visiting a physician where they're having the physician make a recommendation to be on the, the medical marijuana program and receive their card, as well as fill out the application and then get a few uh, documents notarized, which is a waiver signing that everything is uh, true and accurate. So on day 28 approximately, the, the division receives the applications back from the applicant, and that's when our work starts. 
We review the application for accuracy. We, we verify the, uh, the physician is in good standing with the Board of Medical Examiners as well as the Board of Osteopathic Medicine. They need to be in good standing and uh, obviously licensed. And then we also send the background checks to DPS. This is when we start the background check for the applicants. What the background checks are looking for is any disqualifying um, um, felony conviction of sales of a controlled substance. So once we get the DPS uh, background check back, we can uh, go ahead and continue and uh, finalize the application process. If everything uh, is fine and everything is accurate and fully uh, approved, then we'll send a, an, a, an approval letter to the applicant. And that's what they take to the DMV currently to uh, get their card printed. So once they take it to the DMV, the DMV follows pretty much the normal driver's license process. And it'll take about five to 10 days for the applicant uh, to receive their medical marijuana card. So I have highlighted down in yellow, it's, when, we, when the division gets the application, it's taken us approximately 21 days to process that applicant through the process. So we do uh, have a few minors on the program. And if we do get an application with four minor, it is required that they sign a minor release form or their caregiver signs a minor release form. Um, medical marijuana has been proven to uh, reduce the severity of seizures in children. And uh, we uh, do, it, like I said, do have a few on the program. So confidentiality of the, the data and the application information that we collect has been, uh, has been something that we've been working through. We do have a statute, NRS 453A.700 which limits the information that we can provide to the public. Um, there's the legal term in it, but really the legal interpretation is any data obtained from applications to the division and resulting documents we create are confidential. Therefore, we need to really look at the data that we're sending out and make sure that it's none, nothing that's contained within the application that's going to identify the applicant. So this is a report that we publish monthly on our website. Um, and the link's up there if anybody wants to visit it afterwards. It's just the, the number of patient cards that we issue, or the number, of, the number of patient cards, that's our current patient card holder base. Right now, as of Friday last week, we have 6,430 6, registered card holders. We have 342 caregivers, which are um, card holders that are um, licensed they're registered by us to give care to their patients. They're allowed to grow their own until dispensaries are open. Um, then we also break it down by county. So we have Clark County, 4,635. Washoe County, 749. And the balance of the state, 1,046. Uh, well, Clark County represents about 72, 73% of the, the card holders. So uh, building the MME program, which is a medical marijuana establishment program, SB 347A regulation process was transparent and included all stakeholders and local governments. The division included, a, we held about seven public meetings and several amendments were made to the regulations throughout that, uh, throughout that process. So the establishment application process, which is what we're in right now, um, the division issued a 45-day request for applications on May 30th of this year. So right now we're in that 45-day window where applicants are preparing their applications for submittal to us. The division will be accepting applications for all four establishment types for a 10-day working period starting, starting on August 5th. That 10-day period will run August 5th through August 18th. The essential elements of the MME application process, division must accept and receive all the applications that are submitted. Medical marijuana registration certificates will be issued on a merit-based ranking process, which is the application process that we'll be going, uh, doing for 90 days starting August 5th. The division will rank all applications in the respective jurisdictions throughout the state 
and the top candidates will be issued a provisional certificate. These candidates will then take that provisional certificate to their local jurisdictions and local governments for, uh, to start their process. Establishment applicants. Persons applying for medical marijuana establishments certification must demonstrate that they have 250,000 in liquid assets, a property ownership plan, a proposed organizational structure, and their history of tax contributions in Nevada. Establishment applicants, persons holding medical marijuana establishment agent cards or anybody must be 21 years of age or older, have no excluded felony convictions for violence or drug-related offenses, and pay $75 for the issuance of the card as well as their renewal on an annual basis. So the, the persons, that, the people that are responsible for holding an agent card are any, any employee or volunteer of an establishment type. So that could be the owners, the officers, the board members of the, of the company that owns the establishments, as well as the employees that work within the establishments, as well as the volunteers that work within the establishments also. Uh, the division will be processing the agent cards um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as needed based on the, uh, the open dates of the dispensaries and the establishments. Will the MME rankings be public information? Yes, but the division will maintain confidentiality compliant with NRS 453A.700, and the division will release the following information. A list of the applicants who are issued provisional certificates, including their ranking and scores by jurisdiction. Also a list of applicants who are not issued provisional certificates, their final rankings and scores by jurisdiction. Applicants, although, must sign a consent to release information prior to us releasing any information on their application and ranking and scores. Um, that's all I have. I just want to clarify a few things that I didn't touch on in the presentation that came up at the last minute. Uh, so with the passing of the establishments, SB 374, um, prior, to the, prior to the regulations of the establishments, it was a grow your own state. So we had uh, cardholders within the state that were required to grow their own medicine. With the passing of SB 374 now uh, legalizing establishments, which again is cultivation, production facilities, independent laboratories, and, and dispensaries, uh, the patients aren't, uh, will not need to grow their own medicine um, because it will be available in the dispensaries. Um, so that's the, I just wanted to clarify that on an earlier slide that I have. And that, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Lee Plemmel and, and Susan Pansky from the Carson City Community Development uh, Department, and they're going to talk about the Carson City uh, Ordinance. It's a tag team presentation, right? Right. <laughs> Good evening. Again, I'm Lee Plemmel. I'm the Carson City Community Development Director, uh, which is basically all the, the, the development permitting processes for Carson City. Susan's going to be following up. I'm going to, I'm going to cover what the regulations are that were adopted, and then Susan's going to talk a little bit of, about the process. So on, on July 3rd, the Carson City Board of Supervisors adopted the ordinance for Carson City uh, that, that allows the medical, mar medical marijuana establishments in Carson City. Uh, it, that was done after about a six month process of kind of looking at what others were doing, uh, monitoring what the state was doing, discussing it with our Board of Supervisors through the process. And so the ordinance that was, that was adopted, and, and a lot of these regulations actually are um, state regulations that we've, that we've reiterated in our code. What I'm going to cover is our zoning ordinances. So that's the kind of the development, where, where buildings go, where certain uses go, how they're, how, the, how they're formed, what kind of parking, what kind of signage do they have. That's what we deal with. Um, and that's what state law uh, allowed the local jurisdiction to have control of. 
And then Susan will also talk a little bit about business license, with the, which is another area where the state legislature authorized uh, some local control. So in Carson City, and I'll get, some, I'll get to some maps a couple of slides later, but the, with the key being on that first, where, where are these going to be permitted in Carson City, that first table there. We have the dispensaries and then the other cultivation, what we call production facilities for the edibles and testing laboratories. A, a SUP stands for special use permit, so we're requiring a discretionary special use permit. Uh, for every applicant coming into Carson City, which is a public process where we notify the surrounding property owners just like any other special use permit. And we can also place conditions on that, on that approval. Dispen again, I'll get to the maps, but dispensaries are going to be permitted in certain areas in both the general commercial district and general industrial uh, zoning district, whereas the cultivation facilities production facilities, the tester lab laboratories would only be permitted in the general industrial zoning district. Some other, some other uh, regulations that we've written into the Carson City Code, and again, I think all of these on this page follow state regulations, and, and um, it didn't go into all the detail of all the regulations, but the, the state regulations that they look like are much more exhaustive, actually, than ours, but we've picked out some of them to include within, within our ordinance because they relate, again, to, to some of the zoning issues. Uh, for example, you know, no, no consumption of mar marijuana product, sorry, of marijuana products may occur on the premises of any MME. Uh, all the uses of all, all those types of uses must be conducted entirely indoors. I'm not sure if it's on the next page, but we go further and say you can't uh, see any of the products from the outside. Uh, there's restricted access to the facility, so there has to be an identified point of entrance and, it's a, and that there's a lot of security, and that's, that's, again, a place in particular where the state regulations cover that in quite a lot more detail. Um, and the sign requirements for Carson City would be the same as offices. Uh, next slide, please. And, and I would... I would say while we're talking about this that uh, the, they would have to comply with both the city regulations and the state regulations. And as I said, there are more state regulations than are, than are listed here. Um, again, the first one, no, no more than two dispensaries are permitted within the boundaries of Carson City. So there's a maximum on that. The state's only going to issue certificates for two of them. Um, so citywide, we would only have two dispensaries. Again, that's, that's also... Per, per, the, per the state law. Um, again, the setbacks are also per the state law. They cannot be within 1,000 feet of a school or within 300 feet of any other of a number of community facilities like churches, parks, playgrounds, etc. The last two are unique to Carson City. We've, we, uh, there, there are zoning regulations that we've included that are not that are not in the state regulations. We require a 300 foot setback from adjacent residential properties on the same street as an M same street frontage as an MME, and I'll, that's represented a little bit in the maps I'll show in the next. And we're uh, we are limiting dispensary hours to 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Next slide, please. So so looking grab. Graphically, yeah, there we go. There, I, I have three maps, so we'll start on Highway 50. Oh, I'm doing oh you're controlling that over there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you're fighting each other, I see. Um, so the, the, here's, here's our mapping representation of those, where the different types of facilities would be permitted. So the first two slides are where, are where uh, dispensaries would be located. <laughs> On the map, we have this, it, it, just to orient you in the lower left corner there is, is I-580, the freeway, and then we have Highway 50 East heading out and going up to the upper right corner there. Uh, the the reddish-orangish areas along, that, along Highway 50 East are general commercial. The blue areas are general industrial. And those areas are the areas are on this, on this map, the only areas where dispensaries would be allowed. Also on this map, you see kind of some yellow hatched areas, 
and those represent the areas where the residential neighborhoods tie into those commercial and industrial areas and where that 300 foot setback that I referred to earlier would uh, potentially affect the location and prohibit the location of a medical marijuana establishment. So moving on to the next map, uh, this is the other portion in Carson City where dispensaries would be allowed. It's, it's a general commercial area along South Carson Street, basically from Moses Street to the south. Uh, Moses Street is just, is just the one up just north of Kuntz Lane there. And again, uh, the yellow shows the, the areas where the residential areas uh, connect directly with the, with the commercial areas. And then lastly, the last, next last map is of where the other facilities, the testing, cultivation, and production facilities, and that's only in the general industrial district and only within this portion of the city up there. Again, it's actually the same general industrial area out at Deer Run Road vicinity out Highway 50 East, and there's a couple little uh, general industrial zone properties up around the airport where that could potentially also have such facilities. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Susan to talk about the uh, process that people have to go through to Carson City, in Carson City to, for these establishments. Thanks. I'm Susan Pansky, Planning Manager for the Community Development Department, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the next steps are now that we have adopted the land use ordinance. So um, first and foremost, what we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks and months are um, regulations for business licensing. We still need to adopt a business license ordinance that addresses fees and requirements at that level. Um, that's beyond the requirements at the special use permit level. So we'll be looking at that with staff and with our board over the next couple months. Um, with a schedule, as I've shown on this slide, of a first reading for that ordinance in September and then a second reading in October, which will put us having that ordinance in effect before the provisional certificates are issued in November of this year. If someone wants to apply for a medical marijuana establishment license, in Carson City, how we've set the process up is basically a three-step process, and that's in addition to the state, but it, it coincides with what the state requirements are and the state application is. Step number one is what we call a zoning letter, and this is actually a process that's already in place through our planning division processes now. Um, basically, it's a letter that the applicant would request from us at staff level, and we would do a verification of the zoning to determine whether or not they meet all of the initial requirements, such as the setbacks and the zoning. And we would then issue a letter, and they would have that to put into their application packet that goes to the state. As Steve had mentioned, they have a very small window for the state applications. It's in August, starting on August 5th. And um, that for our special use permit process related to when we had adopted our ordinance, it doesn't give applicants enough time to get a special use permit in place before they need to put their applicant applications into the state. So what we've chosen to do is provide this zoning letter to them saying, yes, the location is an appropriate place for a medical marijuana establishment, provided that they get an approved special use permit through Carson City. So that's step number one. Step number two would be the special use permit. And um, just like all of our special use permits in Carson City, we have a monthly schedule. They would submit roughly in the middle of the month to be heard by the Planning Commission at the end of the following month. So it's about a six week process. And the Planning Commission, as Lee had mentioned, is a public board. And they would be heard in front of that public board with the conditions recommended by staff. Um, related to the specific location and suitability of that um, organization and process that they're proposing. The application fees for that special use permit, it's exactly the same as our regular special use permits. It's $2,450. There is a noticing fee in addition to that, but it's, it's basically what it costs for us to notice surrounding property owners for a special use permit. And once they have that special use permit, um, then they'd be able to move forward to the next step. 
since the special use permit could possibly happen while they're waiting for their state license to come or after the fact, we'll kind of tailor our conditions of approval accordingly. So if, for example, the special use permit were to come before the state license is issued, we would have a condition of approval that said you would need to have your state license in place before this special use permit is active. And then the last step for us is business licensing. So in order for an applicant to apply for a business license in Carson City, what they will need to do is first go through the special use permit process and get an approval, meet all of their conditions of approval for their specific location, and then have their state provisional license issued. So what will happen is, provided that we adopt our ordinance for business licensing in October, if the medical marijuana establishment provisional certificates are issued at the beginning of November, if someone already had their special use permit in place at that time, they would need to meet their conditions, provide us with the special, um, the provisional license, and then we would process their business license fee. Now, I had alluded to the, this earlier that we're still working on the requirements and the fees for business licensing, so that will be forthcoming over the next few months. Um, and once that is done, and they get their, their business license, then they will be able to open in Carson City. That concludes the presentation from Carson City. So um, I guess we'll go back to the panel now and answer questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. There you, you have the, the bones of, uh, of what the state and city have done. Uh, we now have a a panel to uh, answer the questions that um, have been submitted to us. And again, um, there are folks in the aisles. If you have questions to write down and submit to them, just ask them for a card, get to them. Uh, on the panel is our uh, uh, Marla McDade Williams. Uh, Marla is the uh, served as the Deputy Administrator of the Division of Public and Behavioral Health when Senate Bill 374 was enacted in 2013. We also have Chad Westham uh, as the Bureau Chief over Medical Marijuana and six other programs within the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Um, Steve, Susan, and Lee. So those are our panelists. I, I know we have a couple of people out in the audience. If other questions uh, uh, come up about particular things, we'll turn to them, but um, let's see what we, um, will the dispensaries be a cash business? Um, I don't know who, who's like to answer that one. Hi, good evening. All right, these two are essentially the same. So, as far as it being a cash business, that's not really addressed in the statutes or regulations. Nothing, you know, at this point is uh, prohibiting that. Okay. Um, will people working in dispensaries have to pass a background check, and how old do they have to be? Yes. Yes, they'll have to pass a background check, and every um, agent, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, must be 21 years of age or older. Okay, thank you. Um, who will be checking the dispensaries, the production sites, uh, et cetera, the, the various establishments for compliance with the state code? who actually does the enforcement. So we're building our staff right now and we're actually at, um, almost done building it. So we'll have two inspectors down in the Las Vegas area as well as two auditors in the Las Vegas up in the northern Nevada um, region. We'll have one inspector and one auditor that'll be out in the field inspecting the establishment types. How, how, many, um, how many establishments would be in Clark County? Where, where? What's permitted down there? You know what the number is. Go ahead, Mark. There is no specific limit on the number of total establishments. So there's a limit on dispensaries of 40 throughout Clark County. 
no limit on the other establishment types. Um, when the division put together its proposed budget for staffing, it identified, anticipated, projected approximately 150 establishments statewide, and that's what the staffing right now is designed to inspect to, and it is a yearly inspection, on-site inspection that's required, and they do have the authority, uh, if there are any complaints, to do those, those investigations as well. Well, as far as the card holders, are there uh, recurring reviews of whether they're still eligible, whether they meet the re initial requirements? Yes, for the, the card holders, there is a renewal process and a, an application is required to renew on an annual basis. Annually? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sheriff, we're going to have a law enforcement question, so you are going to get to come up here. Yeah. Pardon me? I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's, you, let's, let's, now I got you standing up. No camera on the back of my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how do we monitor and detect fake marijuana cards? Um, will the sheriff do stings on the dispensaries to make sure they aren't selling to people without cards or to kids? That's the enforcement question. Uh, obviously. Uh, a required amount of training is going to have to take place to ensure that all of the officers that are doing the enforcement activities are aware of the cards, uh, being able to detect uh, fictitious cards and such. Um, we do have specialized enforcement that will be able to handle that activities. Um, there has been no um, plan to set up uh, any sort of increased sting, as the word you used, uh, activities on the businesses. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, Steve. So I could add a little bit to that. So currently we have a web-based system where law enforcement can uh, verify a card holder is valid um, with the registration of their card, as well as uh, some other things that we'll be doing within the dispensaries verifying um, card holders when they do make purchases. Okay, and these are, these are issued by the DMV, through the DMV? They, they look like a driver's license, is that what they, they look do. like? Okay. They do look like a driver's license, but up top it says medical marijuana card holder. Um, what's this one? Um, this has to do with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the more THC in a marijuana, is, the more desirable it is as a recreational drug. Um, people get high from this. Uh, are, what are these drugs for in a dispensary, and do they differ from what people can get on the street? So it's a distinction about THC, recreational marijuana, and what's available in its dispensary? I'll go ahead and take that question. So one of the requirements of medical marijuana establishments and, the, and um, the marijuana that they'll be producing is that it all be lab tested. So every, and standardized labels on all of the products. So although the THC produces the high, there is a high demand for what they call cannabinoid products, CBD products. So that we do expect, or that there will be a variety uh, and demand for different levels of products throughout the state. And the cultivation facilities will be the ones identifying what the demand is. I mean, responding to the demand, the cardholders will be identifying what is beneficial to them. So uh, we just know that there are, uh, there's a high demand for high CBD products, low THC products, as well as um, a desire for THC items as well, but but again, it will be a standardized label that will go with all of the products that are sold in Nevada, identifying what those levels are in each of those products through lab testing. Okay. Could could you explain? You mentioned uh, CDB, uh, and what, can you t explain kind of the difference between what that means, what that is? Well, and and this is an area where the advocacy community is is more articulate about. Um, what CBD is, but again, it it's produces, it is designed for certain types of conditions to alleviate certain medical conditions without producing the same level of a high as a high THC product would. Um, that combined with some of the other properties of uh, the 
medical or the marijuana plant produce different effects for different people. So it really is up to each patient to, at some point, figure out based on the labeling what works best for the conditions that they have. If you did an internet search, you'd be able to find recommendations for, you know, if someone has epilepsy, they would uh, recommend certain product types that might alleviate that. But it, on some level, it just comes down to each patient um, figuring out what works best for them. And in Nevada, it will be all based on the label that they get. Okay, thanks. Uh, this one, I think, uh, <clears throat> for Lee and Susan, uh, is there a review of property owners leasing to medical marijuana establishments? A review of property owners leasing to medical marijuana establishments. Not sure what they're getting at, but. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe this will help answer it. it there, because the special use permit process is a public process that identifies the owner of the property as well as the applicant. So that may answer the question. So it, if, if it is a lease situation, uh, that will be known through the process. So the owner will be known, the, the lessee will be known, the planning commission, it's a public process, it's a public meeting, is able to ask questions if something comes up, if there's a concern, that can be addressed. Yeah, yes, and, and that's, and it's, uh, especially for commercial businesses, it's quite typical that the owner of the property is somebody different than the person applying for the business or special use permit. And a special use permit, as the name implies, is there is a, spe a particular review process. It's not, it does have to go to the commission. It's not uh, administratively approved. Is that correct? Right. And I'll, I'll to, just to expand on that a little bit, the special use permits are reviewed by the planning commission. They are a board of a seven member board appointed by the board of supervisors. They have uh, the authority to approve special use permits and some other items and uh, those, their approval or denial, their action can be appealed to the Board of Supervisors. Right. Thank you, very good. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me see what I have here. Oh, I still have this one. Uh, how does SB 347 apply to Indian lands? I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go fire ahead. away. I'll go ahead and take that question. So the law only applies to businesses in the state of Nevada. Um, most um, land reservations in the state are not; they don't fall under the jurisdiction of state law. They fall under the jurisdiction of federal law. So although we wouldn't advise a tribe, the division wouldn't advise a tribe whether they could or could not do it the division would struggle to actually issue a certificate in an area that they didn't have jurisdiction over. And, and, and federal law still applies on federal, on, on the reservation land. So it's, it's not really any difference than any other regulation application process. There's nothing special about this or that would or would not affect it. Well, again, the division would not have jurisdiction on, this, on the reservation land right. because it's federal land. So they could not enforce state law in that area. Okay. Um, <clears throat> will controls be put on the packaging of edibles so they don't look attractive to children? Who makes that decision? State, local government? It's about packaging of <clears throat> edible materials. Well, from the state level, there will be very strict controls on the packaging of edibles as well as the standard products and infused products. Um, it's listed in our regulations. Um, they'll be not, you know, packaged in a way that is, um, it has to have an appropriate label. It has to list the laboratory analysis. Um, the package has to be um, not attractive to children and, and uh, our regulations actually state that. We'll be reviewing it as part of our, um, you know, application process and, and on site as we do inspections and if we get complaints, we'll do investigations. I, I don't know if Carson City has additional requirements. No. If I could just supplement that, a, a, a 
cardholder can only purchase up to two and a half ounces of marijuana every 14 days. So when it comes to the edible products, the division has um, developed a lab group as part of its regulations. That lab group will ultimately decide the quantity of THC, CBD that go forward in the edible products so that it can equate to the two and a half ounces that an individual is authorized to buy. So whatever they purchase in edibles is still subject to that two and a half ounce um, limitation. And, and that is a, will be a public forum that the division will be managing um, over the course of the next six to 12 months um, to ensure that they can get the quantities down so that you don't get someone purchasing more than they should have that exceeds their, their limit or that could potentially be harmful to them. Uh, what, <clears throat> what happens if there are more than two applications for dispensaries that are approved by the state for this jurisdiction and then would they be allowed to go find another jurisdiction to open a shop? So if there's, the question is if they, if there's more than two dispensaries in Carson City, right. would they be able to go seek after another yeah. location? Uh, no, their, their application would be for, you know, the local jurisdiction they apply for and then, you know. So they, they would have to reapply, essentially, would be. In another location or yeah. submit an application for that jurisdiction at the same time, the alternate jurisdiction at the same time. Okay. I, I would add further from the Carson City side that if for some reason state law changed and they did approve more than two, which I don't think they would, because that, right? Or they're approving a maximum of two that's per the, per the state law. The law would have to change. That's still, that's still a, within, within the zoning powers of Carson City. Our limit is two, so we would not approve more than two. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think what, what they're looking maybe uh, location shopping or somebody that tries to apply for all over the state and see what they can get, I think maybe is what that question was aiming at. But. Yeah, and because the division is only authorized to have the one 10-day application period, an applicant could very well submit an application in 10 jurisdictions for 10 dispensaries and could be approved if they ranked the highest in those jurisdictions. The only place um, that it would be problematic would be Washoe and Clark County because there's a 10% monopolistic provision that they, no owner, no applicant can have more than 10% of the establishments in that jurisdiction. But if someone did that and ranked the highest, they could conceivably have 10 dispensaries located in various locations throughout the state. Guys, um differentiate between the medical card and the establishment card that an employer or a volunteer has to have. Uh, those are very distinct, I assume, and, and can somebody differentiate between those different cards? Who's required yeah. to have what? So as in Steve's presentation, um, there's, he went over both, but there's a medical marijuana um, registry card is for patients, and they're the ones that, you know, that, that uh, part of the division's been operating for many years where you either have a caregiver or you grow your own to get the medicine that your physician recommends. And then there's agent cards which don't exist yet. Those will be the employees or other associates of the medical marijuana establishments, dispensaries, cultivation, production, laboratories. And they'll have to have a, um, you know, medical marijuana agent card, and those will be those cards will have to be applied for. You have to pass a background check. You have to be 21 years old, and you'll get a card issued by the division to be an agent or an employee of one of those new establishments. Okay. Okay. I think, I think we got that one. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry. What? Well, Will Nevada honor medical marijuana cards from other states? No. We will. Uh, we will. Uh, so the law envisions reciprocity with other states. If they're medical marijuana cardholders from another state, you would be 
author, uh, those people would be authorized to purchase at the dispensaries in Nevada. Um, there's, you know, that'll be up to the dispensaries to review their information to, and make a determination if that card or paperwork looks appropriate. They have to have a, the patient has to sign an attestation that the, that their card or paperwork is appropriate. Um, and then the state, if, if the current law stays the same, the state will be working diligently on a system um, in for 2016 to where, you know, our medical marijuana database and other states can be connected and we can provide that information. And the reason they're doing that is because the law actually changes in 2016. So currently you can do it with the affidavit. In 2016, you can only do it if the other state authorizes the card. For example, California doesn't have a state-issued card system. Um, so in 2016, if they still don't have a state-issued card system, those cardholders won't be eligible to buy in Nevada. But as, as Chad indicated, um, you have to be able to verify only at the state level, not at each local jurisdiction level, and that, law, that will change in 2016. How, how long, what's the timeline for that kind of a database, do you think? Any idea? It's, well, <clears throat> I believe it's um, the database that I was speaking of is to be developed by April 1st, 2016. And, but you know, that's, it's a pretty monumental project and so we'll, we'll um, certainly be working very hard on that. Um, <clears throat> there's a follow-up. I think, uh, Steve, you mentioned how many um, medical marijuana cards have been issued statewide and, and maybe in Clark County, but do we know how many in, for Carson City have been issued? Uh, that's part of the information that's kind of protected with this, our NRS 453.700, so we're not able to break it down within the rural counties, where we're able to say every other county besides Washoe and Clark. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be back to you on that one because <laughs> the number doesn't identify anybody. Issue at, at letting us know how many people, there's no confidentiality involved in that. Is there? We have guidance <clears throat> from the Attorney General's office that in basically in jurisdictions that don't have a high volume of uh, cardholders that like and so then if you start giving numbers that that you know people might be able to figure out who the patients are and so that's why we're operating off the guidance of you know I think we have 6,300 6,400 patients currently statewide and we have broad areas of the state which we can give numbers on but we we're not authorized to give specifics such as um, lesser populated jurisdictions or zip codes? I don't have an issue with you, then I have an issue with the Attorney General's office, and that's who I'll be talking to. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> as my own personal aside there on behalf of the Press Association. Um, is there a limit on the number of prescriptions a doctor, <clears throat> excuse me, a doctor may write <clears throat> in a given time period? Will there be limits by type of marijuana uh, what are there? What other controls are there for doctors that may issue marijuana cards to stop abuse and being too lenient in their distribution of medical marijuana cards? Restrictions on the doctors' controls. Well, currently uh, the doctors recommend medical marijuana to their patients, so the patient will go in and get a. Um, the form that we require within our application uh, filled out and signed by their physician as a recommendation for medical marijuana as a treatment of their condition. Um, we also keep that information uh, within our database, within the division, um, and I don't foresee any limits being placed on it. Um, it's not prohibited by the regulations. And I think it's unlike a prescription that you get now for certain pharmaceutical products, a physician is making a recommendation that a patient can benefit from marijuana and they're doing it one time per year. And they're not saying how much anyone um, will benefit by, you know, or what type of marijuana, whether it's high THC or high CBD, they're not making that level of recommendation. 
They're simply saying, we believe that you can benefit from the use of, of medical marijuana. And again, they have to do that one time per year based on the medical condition of the patient. Um, the division under the new law has the authority now to do some assessment of physicians that are recommending marijuana to determine uh, if they are recommending at a higher rate than is necessary. It's, it's a somewhat subjective criteria that the division has to work through and I believe they're still working through that, but um, it, it is ultimately up to the Physician Licensing Board to oversee physician practice, not the division, um, not any local jurisdiction. And, th and this question kind of follows up on that because it asks, can any doctor prescribe marijuana or is there any special certific certificate needed? Um, is there any qualifications there on who can prescribe? Any Nevada licensed physician or osteopathic physician can recommend <clears throat> it. And again, it's a recommendation. It's not a prescription, and there is a difference. Uh, good, because that's this question. Why can't pharmacies with medical degrees dispense marijuana <clears throat> when people with no medical knowledge in a dispensaries can? You know, uh, this is Chad Westham. So, Dr. Tracy Green, our chief medical officer, if you want to come to the microphone, that might be one helpful for you to share. I think you had a conversation with the pharmacy board on that. This mic's working. So, um, currently, marijuana is not FDA approved for use, and it is what is called a category one medication. Category one medications cannot be prescribed by physicians. Pharmacists can only dispense prescribed medication. So in lieu of both of those facts, pharmacies will not be able to um, uh, dispense any kind of medical marijuana um, at this point. So the terminology between <coughs> prescribed and dispensed is important here, and, and that kind of cuts to the the reason we have dispensaries over there and pharmacies over here and how that how me <clears throat> medical marijuana is classified, to, to restate what she said. Absolutely. What Marla said is really important. This is not a prescription process for physicians. It's a recommendation process based on a diagnosis that the patient has. Thank you very much. That's, Tracy Green is the state's uh, chief medical officer, so when, like I said, we have experts in the audience and we're going to turn to them when we need them, right? right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, this might be an interesting <clears throat> one because a judge in Clark County uh, declared it was a conflict of interest to own a small casino and also be a shareholder in a marijuana dispensaries. What other occupations might be considered uh, in conflict? Um, would doctors or other prescribers, would elected officials um, have be considered to have uh, conflicts of interest in in owning or operating a uh, me uh, medical marijuana establishment? Kind of an interesting one, huh? It is an interesting question, and the law actually <clears throat> didn't identify any specific conflicts. So it's been up to the respective licensing boards of other entities to determine whether or not they believe there are conflicts with any of their licensees. The division doesn't have the authority to assess conflicts. They can only issue certificates based on what the law has, has said, and the law doesn't identify specific conflicts. Just to add, uh, there's some information about that from, you know, for as far as the physicians of Board of Medical Examiners for Nevada um, at medboard.nv.gov, um, there's some information on that topic at that site. So they've issued guidance to their licensees and, yes. and they can find it there. So it's really an issue for the licensing boards. Correct. Gaming Control Board has taken a stand. Um, medical board has taken has given an opinion so others may be taking this up and so it would be if somebody sees a potential conflict that would be who to approach 
<clears throat> whoever's licensing those professionals. Does that make sense? That's correct, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, other than smoking, how, does, how is medical marijuana dispensed? Uh, pills, liquid, what other forms are there? There's lots of forms. Um, you know, there's there's a medical marijuana is um, it's there's inhaled. There's some devices that where it, it can be ingested uh, through your respiratory system, but not through smoking. There's um, uh, edible medicines. There's infused products, um, and then there's also lotions and. Um, you know, other and other ones I'm not thinking of at the moment where, you know, all of which get into your system um, and patients, you know, make use of for their conditions. Probably, yeah, probably anything that they think will work. Did I miss any? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this was mentioned earlier. If a card holder can only buy, uh, how many ounces? Two and a half ounces every 14 days? Correct. Uh, who will be tracking how much or how often they buy? Uh, how would it be, how would they track that? So the state's building a verification system because we house all the data for the, uh, the patient, the cardholder registry system at the division. We'll make that data available to the dispensaries at the dispensary level um, in real time where they can verify that the cardholder is valid. Um, they are who they say they are, as well as their purchases within the last 14 days. Will, will, they be, will that be a mandatory thing, or will that be a, a, a voluntary check on that, whether? That will be a mandatory. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm look ahead. Can a person with a Class A driver's license obtain a medical marijuana card? I'm not sure Class A is a uh, com commercial driver's license. Commercial driver's license I believe. So uh, under the state's licensing, driver's licensing laws, um, they would not issue a medical marijuana card to a person who had a commercial driver's license. Um, the division would still process that individual's application, but once it got to processing at DMV, DMV would would not be able to issue the medical marijuana card if they had the commercial driver's license. Okay. Uh, are dispensaries um, requ required to grow all of their own medicine? I, I don't think that's true, but if not, what percentage of their stock must be grown themselves and what will be the regulations for sourcing more medications. Do you understand that question? Because I'm not sure I do. Well, let me take a stab at it. Okay. Um, the, the, the state law does not say that a dispensary has to get its product from a specified cultivation facility. So the way that the regulations um, are, have been adopted, you can have wholesale cultivation selling to any dispensary in the state of Nevada and a dispensary can buy from any cultivation facility or production facility. Now, so if you're producing edibles or lotions or whatever, you're um, certified as a production facility, um, a dispensary can buy from any other licensed establishment in the state. Okay, <clears throat> so that, that, this question's, <clears throat> excuse me, right on top of, what assurances do we have that any marijuana sold is not coming from some cartel somewhere? Some drug cartel. Well, that's the whole purpose of the, the law and, and in Nevada and, and Senate Bill 374 is that, you know, each of these establishments will be, um, have be certified by the state and appropriately authorized at the local level and there'll be cultivation. Um, you know, establishments and dispensaries, and the dispensaries will be purchasing from the cultivators, and they'll be tracking of, uh, of that inventory at each of those businesses, and we have both inspectors and auditors that'll be going in on a regular basis and verifying um, that the products at the dispensaries are 
are going through the proper channels from the cultivators and that there's no um, inappropriate diversion of the product. And the lab testing process as well will help identify the genetics of the plants. So through that process and the inventory control systems that will be maintained by all of the establishments, um, some of them are so sophisticated enough to actually um, band and identify product from the very beginning as a seedling all the way through the, the final sale. Um, but you also have the uh, verification that's, that comes with lab testing to ensure that what somebody identified that they bought as a cultivate, at a cultivation facility and sold at the dispensary is the same product throughout the, the, the supply chain. It's, yeah, speaking of laboratories, because this question is, uh, there are multiple laboratories certifications and inspection programs in various state agencies. So uh, would these laboratories be subject to certification licensing or inspection by any agencies other than the MME program? So no, they have to come through, they have to get their certificate from the division, and if they did some other type of business, again, then whoever licensed them for that other type of business would have to make sure that it was consistent with their licensure to, to also test marijuana. Um, but the division, um, for anybody that tests marijuana in Nevada has to have a state-issued certificate. And if they're solely testing marijuana, then they solely get inspected by the medical marijuana program. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, what what diseases uh, are typically treated by medical marijuana? Um, I ask you to please name as many maladies as possible. <laughs> Off the top of your head. So. Well, the state law actually lays out some of the eligible conditions, um, and I would defer to Dr. Green to maybe go into more detail, but really it is a, it's a physician-patient um, relationship. And as a physician is treating a patient, if he determines that that patient could benefit, then he's within his practice to recommend it. Um, but I don't know if Dr. Green wants to build more on that or not. Well, the law specifies certain um, disorders or characteristics that would qualify for medical marijuana. They tend to be in larger categories. So, for example, um, muscle spasms, but it's not specific in regard to the degree, but it's understood by those prescribing that it's intended for those with severe or unremitting symptoms that have essentially failed other treatment modalities. Um, that includes things like seizures, which was discussed previously, as well as our biggest um, prescriber base is for those with severe chronic pain. Um, I think the HIV population, there's a lot of uh, studies that are being done surrounding wasting or the loss of muscle mass and appetite. So there are other characteristics that are also um, part of the inclusion for the recommendation for medical marijuana. Thanks again. Um, this is about, uh, I think, the, uh, the background checks on the applicants. Uh, if, if a corporation holds an interest in a medical marijuana establishment, would all shareholders be required to provide background and financial information? Um, how deep is the check, background check on? So. That's a good question, and that's something that we were um, <clears throat> actually answered on our frequently asked questions, which are on our website as people are preparing their applications. And so um, a lot of the answer to that question is related to if, if it's an investor or shareholder, if they'd be considered an owner. And Steve, I believe it's if they have 5% ownership or more that a, a background check is appropriate. Um, and, you know, whereas, you know, shareholders of a, of a large company, you know, maybe they have thousands of shareholders, so obviously a, a good number of those shareholders aren't going to equal 5% or more. So there is a threshold there, though, that if Correct. you're a significant shareholder, <clears throat> you could be 
subject to a background check. Correct. So, right. uh, do, if uh, some counties are, are not proceeding uh, with their local process, uh, will the state still process the applications um, for if somebody applied in one of those counties? What happens then? We'll be reviewing all the applications that come to our offices uh, and we're required to do so. And, you know, we will have, starting August 5th, a 90-day period where we'll be reviewing those applications and um, scoring them and ranking them. And, you know, as we get through that process, we'll be in contact with the local jurisdictions and we'll see if they have appropriate, you know, ordinances or other means set up at the end and that's you know really remains to be seen for a number of jurisdictions across the state but for example in lyon county um, lyon county is eligible for one dispensary so the division is going to go through if they get an applicant from lyon county they're going to take the highest rank applicant and issue a provisional certificate and send it to wherever that jurisdiction you know send the app it goes back to the applicant, but then the applicant can approach whatever it is, unincorporated Lyon County, City of Yarrington, City of Fernley, with its provisional certificate, and then that jurisdiction would have to deny it. Um, so that is how the law right now is would have to work. And then once that jurisdiction denies it, then the division would have to follow suit and deny it because you have to have both levels of approval to be able to operate. I smell lawsuit, so. <laughs> but. And again, that's, that's the law that the division was dealt with, with um, administering, and, and that's how right. it's been determined to, right. to deal with it. Um, but that's, I, I understand that those jurisdictions, that's, um, they, they understand that, so. Um, what, I had one here. Oh, this is about for approved card holders. Are there provisions to allow for delivery services, either as a standalone business or as part of the brick and mortar uh, MME? So there's delivery services to patients from dispensaries. That's authorized. Uh, there's a limitation on the amount of mar medical marijuana that they're the delivery vehicles can have with them. Um, I think that's probably the, the root of the question. There's, of course, going to be transportation of the product from where it's grown uh, to the dispensary, from the cultivator to the dispensary, um, if they're not in the same, you know, complex, so to speak. And um, there's there has to be transportation plans, there has to be um, delivery drivers with agent cards, and there's a lot of restrictions and appropriate, um, you know, guidelines or appropriate um, limitations on that in the regulations to prevent um, anything inappropriate. So they would, they would have to be a part of the application from that particular dispensary? It couldn't be a standalone? No. Okay. No standalone delivery services. They would have to work for them, be part of that application, have Correct. a card, the whole nine yards. Yeah. And, and anybody who's delivering now in the state of Nevada is doing it illegally. Right. Out on the highway <laughs> as fast as they can. Um, let's see. I think we kind of answered that one. So. Uh, during the, the uh, June 19th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, you, you guys haven't been answering a question for a while, so I'm going to get to you. Why did they decide to move the setback from 1,000 to 300 feet when the Planning Commission recommendation was 1,000 feet? Is that true? Is that what happened? Yeah, and, no. and we're, you know, we as staff can't speak for the Board of Supervisors specifically as Yeah, you why say that's a policy anything, decision, anything. right? Yeah, that's a policy decision. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I would just say through the process, we considered a lot of different methods of, of zoning regulations, including setbacks at the Planning Commission. There was a lot of uh, residents that came out that were concerned about uh, distances from residential areas, and there was a, a flat 300-foot 
residential setback that came out of this planning commission meeting as a result of that. If, if could you go back uh, to our first zoning map on the presentation there? So, so if you if you look at our our commercial corridors are pretty narrow and they're behind them is res, is residential pretty much. So if you squeezed 300 feet off the corridor, you'd effectively prohibit it along much of those same areas. Um, so we we we, kid, we came up with this. We can go back one more. I think the, the other one shows more of a, you know, you can see the 300 foot at the, at the locations where the streets intersect, but if you just continued that from the closest spot, it basically squeezes all the way to the, to the center of the road and doesn't leave much area. So you would effectively be prohibiting it at that point for, for much of these same areas. But I've, secondly, what the board did, they also, pretty significantly reduce the areas in which these would be located around the city. We, they, out of the Planning Commission, there was that setback, but it also included more areas that were zoned general commercial and more industrial zoning districts where they were allowed. But, but the board, I would say, the Board of Supervisors also eliminated some of those areas, so actually reduced the areas in Carson City in which they'd be permitted. So, so if I understand, along that quarter, you, you pretty much can't get within <clears throat> 300, <clears throat> excuse me again, be on a main street and be within 300 feet of a residential area? Well, that, that's a broad generalization, <clears throat> but for a significant portion of it, that's virtually true. There are certainly exceptions. You can see as you go through it, there are areas where it's wider and but where it's narrower, certainly you could see some of those setbacks that go, they touch each other almost from either side. So essentially in, in those areas, <clears throat> it did make a difference whether it was 300 feet or 1,000 feet, it was still gonna be too close. Is oh that yeah, the, well the question was right, reducing it from 1,000 from a feet. Well, the other part of the question was re reducing it from a, and again, policy decision, re reducing it from 1,000 feet to 300 feet, you know, and, from other from other community centers. So if you look mm. on here, the, the the other red hatching up there is 300 feet from community facilities. So I guess the question, why isn't that? Why did they reduce it from? Uh, it was recommended at the planning commission to be a thousand feet. But if you look at where those are and extend those out to a thousand feet, they really don't have an effect in this case on on those commercial areas and in, in reducing it any further. <clears throat> Um, on the um, on that state application, there was a one of the requirements two hundred fifty thousand in assets. Uh, how is that defined? And also about what the tax history they're supposed to submit. Do, are there definitions on on what you're looking for in those? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars in uh, liquid assets. That's what's specified in the statutes. Yeah, a liquid or a liquid. Uh, thank you, Marla. So, and then the other question was the taxes. Yeah, it, it asked for the Nevada tax history. What are, what are they looking for there? Do you know? Oh, um, sorry. That's on uh, their contributions to. Nevada or its jurisdictions that's and that's actually you know there's a lot of detail we provided on our frequently asked questions on our website as far as answering that question um, and it's, it's actually something that's specified in the statutes and it's part of the application and, and both of those are part of the scoring system then is that why you're obtaining that information we're can it's will be part of the the ranking that we're required to do, it was specified in the statutes. Okay. Yes, I, I still got a few here. <laughs> um, what uh, mar marijuana business in Carson City? Well, they'd be charged a fee or a local tax, and what about sales tax? How does that work? So. 
At the state level, they're charged a 2% tax, and that goes to the state, but at the Carson City level, it would be um, the standard sales tax rate, and then whatever fee that we set at the business license level, and that'll be coming forward in October. The actual business license fee has not been set at, <clears throat> right? Correct. Is there a range that's being considered? It's very, very broad right now, so nothing that I could really narrow down at this point. What's the most Carson City charges for a business license on anything? Do you have any idea? Uh, you know, our business licensing is its kind of dependent on what type of business it is because there are several different levels based on number of employees, square footage, in the um, case of casinos, number of machines, so there's not really a good cap number that I could really give you. Okay. I asked that. I asked that question of our of our business license department too. And yeah, our our business we're we're, we're being business friendly. Our business license fees are actually quite low. Our gaming license fees are are higher based on machines. And I think you know the range is obviously from very small down to to very minimal. But I think it's it's up to ten to fifteen thousand dollars per year at a casino, or possibly even more for the larger ones that they pay in gaming okay. fees. So we can assume it might be somewhere in between there. <laughs> this is the well, journalist and, and, and me coming and, out trying to pin them down on what we're looking at. Yeah, pin, I, 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 you, we're, we're working with the DA's office on this uh, and the sheriff's office in particular on the business license because so, this is a fee that's recurring. It, it, we're monitoring what others are doing down in southern Nevada. Uh, we've seen some really high business license fees, and I mean like $70,000 annually, but they have, we're still evaluating that. They have different processes that they are going through uh, for their business licenses than we, than we do. So we're still analyzing all of that to make some recommendations uh, bring forward to our board. Okay. And, and um, this question says, the mayor says this is not an economic issue. So why did the city decide to go ahead and have dispensaries when other communities said they're not going to. I know that's a policy question, but uh, you can take a crack at it. <laughs> Defend this board of supervisors. Or the, or the mayor, well, uh, both. Well, I th you know, and well, you can relate what the speak discussion for the board was. of supervisors right. again, certainly, but um, you know, part of it is it's uh, state law, it's, it's authorized legally in Nevada. Uh, the, 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 no, I, I can't speak for the board. And, I, you know, there's five, there's five members, and I'm sure in the end they have five different reasons for ultimately their opinions, yes or no, on the final outcome. I, I agree, and I suggest you call them individually and ask them that question. So. <laughs> um, do we know what the... Uh, the tax collected uh, from marijuana uh, sales will be used for, um, is, it, is it designated? Does it go into the general fund? Is it coming back to the local jurisdiction, pay for law enforcement and any other compliance requirements? The state's tax collection goes to the distributive school account. That's right, okay. And, that's, and, because, and because it's sales tax, <laughs> so that as, as Susan, I think said earlier, the, the, the uh, Carson City portion is the same as it buying a TV or anything else. We get our portion that goes to the general fund and the other specific funds that get a portion of the sales tax. Um, but to further answer the question, where, where we're looking at, at raising money for specific uses like uh, drug awareness programs that, or anything like that, that's where we want to tie that in with the business license which is which is an annual fee and and uh, we believe could be used for specific uses like that or could be identified for specific uses like well because our this and this question has, gets at that are, are there are there costs to Carson City to do this um, that need to be covered so as again in Susan's presentation noted that our special use permit fee is the same for any other special use permit and we felt that 
that's a partial cost recovery that's just uh, intended as with any other applicant to cover a portion of the staff time and resources that are used to process those um, and you saw what it was it was two thousand twenty four twenty four hundred dollars something like something like that we're going to have two dispensaries possibly in Carson City on a one-time basis it's not, it's it's not a lot of money so we're not looking at trying to justify a significant increase there again the place we're going to look at it to look at re cost recovery on any impacts is through the annual business license. Um, <clears throat> uh, somebody said earlier about the cultivation facilities must be in industrial zones and indoors. Uh, would a greenhouse qualify as indoors if it's if what's in there or shielded from view? Do you, have you taken that into? Yeah, so there's um, the you know, the law does require um, and, and the regulations that it be an enclosed facility, but, you know, that's going to be subject to the applications we receive. You know, a greenhouse is not prohibited, and so if um, they're able to design that to where they can meet the requirements of the statutes and the regulations, then it's a possibility. And, and medical marijuana card holders currently growing their own marijuana, uh, will they be allowed to continue to grow their own? Um, if so for how long and who, who checks on that? They'll be allowed to grow their own um, until there's a dispensary in their area within 25 miles. And then if, um, if they're if they're between them and their physician and the recommendation that for their medicine, if they were um, recommended to have a strain that's not provided by the dispensary that's within 25 miles, then they're authorized by the the law to grow their own. Still. Okay, and so who who would know? Who would check on that? Who would? So the division will actually be responsible for issuing, authorizing, uh, specifying that a person can grow their own. And they'll have their license will, you know, their medical marijuana card will say that they're authorized to grow their own. But ultimately, the whole law is really one of possession, identifying who can actually possess marijuana at any given time. Um, so it becomes more of an issue for law enforcement than the division. The division won't be going out and doing any spot checks on any of the cardholders. It becomes one of when law enforcement finds someone in possession, then they verify are they a lawful card holder and are they lawfully authorized to grow their own and if they find that they're not then it then it falls into the criminal justice system okay and that's that's what I'm going to sheriff can you come up just tell us what kind of um, yeah wake up uh, no I know you're listening closely but um, what what law enforcement issues do you foresee coming about with these establishments well, you know, I, I, I'll come back to what you said you would like to come back to. If you're not going to tell us how many cardholders are in the county, what else are you not going to tell us? Well, you have access to the system now to verify but whether someone's... But he said that you're not going to tell us. Law enforcement I, does have access now. You can verify when you stop someone, and they, have, they do this now. Um, they can verify whether or not they're a lawful cardholder. The law specifically authorizes the division to issue I, that enforcement. I understand. That information to law enforcement. That's not what, the, but see, that's not what I asked. You said you won't tell the counties, the rural counties, how many cardholders there are. And the Attorney General doesn't want us to know, because I guess we're not big enough adults. What else will you not tell us while we're out there trying to enforce the laws, or do you, what else do you expect us to enforce that you're not going to do. Is that, a, is that a fair? That, that's, that's pretty broad, but that's a good question. <laughs> well, actually, Anybody law, want to step up? Law enforcement is authorized to... Uh, I guess to the question know. would be what kind of information do you think you would want? Um, the law specifically authorizes law enforcement to know whether or not to, someone's a lawful cardholder. So if you're asking... Um, what kind of condition do they have, then no, we would not be able to authorize, the division could not say, because it's really not relevant. They are an eligible lawful cardholder. So I don't know what other kind of information would be needed, 
but again, we would have the division would have to fall back to what they're authorized to give pursuant to the law. And right now, it's not information about what a cardholder's conditions is, are, um, how many kids they have, you know, none of that personal information. Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, the only reason I bring it up is, is just because of this rural county issue that apparently we, we're not going to be authorized to know how many cards are authorized in our jurisdiction. So it's difficult to track, I would assume by you folks, whether or not the jurisdiction is out of control or in control. But will you share that information with law enforcement? Now, what we have advised um, all local governments, there are provisions in the Nevada Revised Statutes that authorize local governments to get information from the division that's not specifically authorized. Now, we have worked with jurisdictions to give information that they've needed. What we've advised in all of the medical marijuana ordinances is that you specifically put in place provisions that protect the confidentiality of the confidentiality of that information the same way we have to protect the confidentiality of it. So if Carson City enacts an ordinance that says you're going to protect it and you want to know, you know, the zip codes of the cardholders, then we could do that, but you also have the obligation then to protect the, the confidentiality and you couldn't give much, it to Much Barry. like we already do. Right. Do you want me to sit down now? No, that's all right because you're <coughs> So you're on, you're on my turf now also as well, because the law, as I read it, <clears> or <throat> the regulation, is very broad about confidentiality. But how, how, you, how do you expect a city to issue a, a building permit, take a public process before a planning commission and so on, and, and try and protect confidentiality of the people who are owning, running, No, now you're, now you're confusing things. Okay. The um, information about establishments, once in a dispensary is ready to go, everybody's going to know the address of the dispensary. They, they get their provisional certificate, they're coming back to the local government. Only the cardholder information is, is, is specifically protected. Um, so once you get into the establishments, there clearly is a need to know where are they, um, and the division is going, it has every intention of working closely with law enforcement, code enforcement at the local government level, everybody that needs to know. Um, and if there's, there's an allegation that a dispensary is opening its doors after 8 p.m., um, then the division is happy to work with law enforcement and say, all right, let's all go in and let's verify what's going on here. Okay. So there are two different types. There. And, and that's a excellent excellent point because whose jurisdiction is that going to fall under so again some of this is criminal and some of it then becomes administrative is the state going to step up or the state is the community expected to step up the state has the authority to go in and do any investigation that um, it gets a complaint about i understand authority and then it can if it if it if the local government if carson city if sheriff furlong says i want to know every time you guys go in on a complaint then they can work that out with you and they can tell you. So it, it's, can. it will, they will. Okay. Yeah. That actually law sharing information with law enforcement for investigative purposes is specifically authorized in the statutes. The other piece that um, I think is important is again, the law is one about possession. Who can possess marijuana at any given time? If you're an agent, you're authorized. If you're a cardholder, you're authorized. If you're, uh, but beyond that, you're not authorized, and it's criminal. So if, for example, let's say law enforcement says, you know what, we don't have the time to go out with you, go out and do your investigation, and the division validates a complaint of um, something that's outside of what their authority is, they have to turn it over to law enforcement because then it becomes a criminal investigation. Yeah. It's, they can't even do anything with some of the information that they get. It is a criminal act at that point. But I, as you said, I, and I want to just get this clear, there's two officers in the south and one in the north? Staffing? We've got, uh, we have inspectors and auditors. We have four in the south of inspectors and auditors. We've got um, two in the north. Two in the north to cover? One, one each. What do you define by north? Well, their, their office will be in Carson City. They'll cover, you know, northern areas, 
northern Nevada. Yeah, because some say the north is everything north of Clark County. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the, am okay. I right? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> now you're going to make it go sit down. That's a good question, but we haven't established that yet. And part of it, again, is workload based on the estimate of the number of establishments determined that there will be need of oversight of. If it turns out, for some reason, the, the, the um, complaint investigations are way beyond what the division can manage, then they're obligated to go back to the legislature and ask for more staffing to ensure that they're adequately covering it. Um, and the work that they do will justify their argument with the legislature. Uh, and I'll move on, but I just want to, if I can, clarify, because when you say cardholders, <clears throat> you're talking about patients, yes. not the Correct. agents of the dispensaries and growing facilities and Correct. so on. Because, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> do doctors describe a dosage? Uh, if not, who determines what level of THC or what method of delivery um, happens with mar medical marijuana. And again, it's just the recommending, um, the physician says to the patient, I believe you can benefit from the use of marijuana, mm. and, it, and it's up to the patient to figure out what best works for them. Okay. So they don't d prescribe dosage oh, or recommend my, dosage. They don't prescribe, again, I use that word, but, uh, okay. I mean, and this is the same question, really, but I think it's, it is interesting whether um, doctors um, know what, what kind of consultation they would do with a patient to know what, what works best, how much they might need, what kind, um, presumably that goes on um, between a doctor and a patient who's going to, to say, yes, I think that would help. Um, how would it help? How much would help? How should I do this? I, I think we would have to defer to Dr. Green. Um, right, no state right now in the U.S. who has a, a medical marijuana system is at that level. I think in Nevada, um, we, based on the lab testing that we're requiring and the standardization of the labels, I think you're going to see some of that start to change. Um, because right now it's somewhat of a word-of-mouth system. Um, orange Kush is really great for me, you ought to try it. Um, and one Orange Kush at one dispensary could be a different property level of Orange Kush at another dispensary. So the lab testing system that we have in this state and the standardized label will start equalizing those things. The THC content, patients are going to know what it is. The CBD content, they're going to know what it is. And they're going to be able to determine whether or not um, what one dispensary is telling them is there's any difference between what they're getting and the next one. But really, that's, that's the best place it can start. And you have to remember that it's not widely studied in the U.S. because of the FDA limitations on doing that. Right. Um, so <laughs> some of it becomes word of mouth, and some of it, again, just becomes patients figuring out what works for best, best for them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I want to thank you. Overall, all five of you, um, for sitting in the hot seat, answering questions on, on policies, on laws, on things that you were, it's your job to figure out how those are supposed to work. Um, decisions largely made by other people for you to, to make work, um, and that's what your job is. And I really appreciate you coming this evening and, and uh, answering these questions and taking the time to inform people about um, what is going to be a process that's, that's still being sorted out, still being worked on, still regulations both at the state and, and the city that uh, need to be done. And thank particularly <clears throat> Sierra Nevada Forums, Partnership Carson City uh, for sponsoring this, for, for doing this, inviting you folks here. That's what uh, Sierra Nevada Forums does, provides citizens with fact-based information then uh, several of these kind of forums on very important issues to bring people in and give a chance to ask questions and find out what's really going on in the community and the state with this and, and of course partnership Carson City which I am on the board of I work with them for quite a while they do a lot of great work and uh, they're trying to make healthy effective community and uh, uh, 
do, do a lot of work here with a lot of different uh, agencies and, and organizations. So I especially thank you all for coming out and turning out to, to listen to this and ask some questions. I think we got a lot of good information. I certainly found out a lot of things that I wasn't sure I understood. And so thank you very much to, to everybody for coming out tonight. There are the, the partnership Carson City Youth have some booths uh, that you probably saw on the way in. Take some time, get some information, um, <clears throat> learn more about what Partnership Carson City does, and especially what uh, some of those young people out there who uh, put in an awful lot of time and work to, uh, to, to carry out the mission for all of us. So again, thank you very much and appreciate you coming. <laughs>